Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their financial support helps cover the costs associated with hosting and producing the Backyard Ecology podcast and blog. If you would like to join them, you can find out more information on the Backyard Ecology website or by searching for Backyard Ecology on the Patreon website. Today we are talking with Jeremy French about grasslands and grassland birds. Jeremy is the Interior Low Plateau Ecoregion Coordinator for Quell Forever and the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. Hi, Jeremy. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hi. No, thank you for having me on. Yes. And I'm really excited to talk with you because I know that you and I can just sit here and completely geek out about grasslands and all kinds of different topics related to grasslands for, well, for hours, really. <laughs> but today we're going to really focus more on grassland birds. But before we get started into that, can you just tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got interested in nature and the outdoors and grasslands? Absolutely. So like you said, I'm the Interior Low Plateau Eco Region Coordinator for SGI and Quail Forever, which is a really fancy way of saying I wear a lot of hats and my entire job is geared to across all kind of facets, just grassland restoration and conservation within that eco region. Um, which includes about six states. So some days that means education, giving talks, you know, leading workshops, leading hikes. Other days I'm writing management plans or just trying to make connections um, and really conserve, you know, grasslands on both public and, and private land. As you know, kind of in the Southeast, there's not a lot of education about our grasslands sometimes. So really pushing that education and helping the people in our communities who have interests in conserving grasslands or doing habitat work um, is a big bulk of my job is just, you know, educating them on the needs of these systems and how we can better manage them. I kind of got interested in the outdoors in a really interesting way. <laughs> <laughs> so I always tell people that I grew up in grasslands before I even knew it. I've spent my entire life in grasslands. And I, when I was very young, I grew up in Southern Florida. I spent all my time kind of messing around in the swamps and like prairies of the Everglades. And I didn't know what they were. They were just nature to me. I was just going out, hanging out, hiking around with friends. Um, and I was really fortunate because Florida is an extremely diverse and like beautiful place. And I really didn't understand that when I lived there and how everywhere else was very different. So when I was 18, I moved away from Florida to Iowa, which is an extreme culture shock. And I started trying to figure out what did I wanted to do with my life or my career or the same things that college kids go through. And I was actually an engineering major, mechanical engineering. I was got all the way to being about six credits shy of graduating. Um, and I always like had snakes and pets and was like very like animal centric. And even before I became a biologist, like I can ID a lot of animals just because I spent so much time with them. And I was sitting around at lunch one day and one of my very good friends, Wesley Yoder, comes up to me and he's a bio major. I didn't even know that was a thing. He's like, hey, we're going to this wildlife conference. You know, it's just a bunch of people who like to talk about animals. I really think you'd be interested, you know, if you've got the time, you want to just come, it's free. And I was like, sure, I'm not doing anything, you know, let's go hang out. And we went to the Iowa chapter of the Wildlife Society's meeting. We sat there and we just listened to all this research. And it happened to be that the guy who handles the biology department for our university was also there. So at this meeting, I had like this eye opening awakening. I was like, oh my God, people do this for like a living and they like do research and they like catch animals. Like that is so much more fun than like building stuff. And I was like, hey, is there any way I can double major? You know, engineering is a very hard degree, but you know, I'm a okay student. Um, and he said, yeah, sure, I think you can maybe do it, but are you sure you just don't want to stay an engineer and like have a giant pet collection at your house one day? And I was like, I don't know, Let, let's try this out. So I, I started double majoring and I got to about my senior year and I decided to entirely leave my engineering degree um, 
six credits shy of an engineering <laughs> degree um, and focus entirely on wildlife. At that time, I was kind of developing into a really good researcher in the Midwest. I had written multiple research grants as an undergrad, primarily researching bison and herps within tall grass prairie remnants um, and how that interaction works, how their interaction with, with fire works. I also did a lot of research for the Army Corps of Engineer where they're doing similar things to what we're doing in the South now. You know, this was seven or eight years ago. They were going in and they had all this second growth forests, really kind of gnarly stuff that didn't have a lot of biodiversity and they were converting it to oak hickory savannah. But to the public, that's not like the prettiest process at times. So they got a lot of pushback and they said, hey, we need some researchers to come in here and do surveys for birds, do surveys for herbs, for reptiles, amphibians, small mammals, large mammals, and odonates. And I was like, you know, I'm not busy enough. I'm double majoring. I think I can write a research project for that. So I was doing all those things all at once. And I really didn't realize like that this was any different than any other bio <laughs> major or anything. I thought I was just doing things. I was having fun. I was catching snakes. I was in the field every day. And it really didn't hit me until I started applying for like my next job and my next job. And I ended up working and bouncing around the Midwest for a long time, doing a lot of prairie restoration, everything from like sand prairies to true prairies, oak hickory savannas to even things that we call goat prairies, which are these near vertical prairies that occur only along the Northeast Mississippi River. And um, they have very high level of endemism and really, really cool places. And then one day I kind of decided to move to Wyoming. Um, I picked up everything and I, uh, not to say that I got bored, but I was like, you know, let's go try something else. I got to work kind of in sagebrush step while in Wyoming, do a lot of short grass prairie stuff in Wyoming. And then one day I saw this job for grasslands in Tennessee. And the first thing that I thought I was like, there's no grasslands in Tennessee. That's crazy. <laughs> But that pay looks pretty good. Let me just put my interview in. And I interviewed and I moved down here, sight unseen, from Wyoming. And my mind was just completely blown. That's when I met Dr. Estes. And we went and saw all these gorgeous, just gorgeous prairie remnants and the oak savanna remnants and these glades. And it kind of opened up this whole new world for me where I have all this research and this knowledge and this botanic and wildlife knowledge from the Midwest and even the Intermountain West to now be able to bring all that knowledge of management into the Southeast and look at these places that are very obvious to me, you know, are, are grassland remnants or, or had grasslands at some points and be able to use that education. It's been a blast in all honesty. Some people like, they're like, you work so much. And I'm like, oh, it's not really work to me. It's fun. Like I, I enjoy my job. And that's kind of been like my route through research and, and getting involved in the outdoors was just one of my buddies one day said, hey, you like animals? You want to come to a meeting? And it kind of cascaded into what it is now, I guess. Yes. And it's amazing how things happen like that sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's pretty... I'm pretty fortunate to have found because even when I was, you know, doing engineering stuff, we were doing like tours and I would think in my back of my head, I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to be stuck in a factory all day. Is this, am I doing this because, you know, I like the idea of making a lot of money or being an engineer or do I actually like this? And once I found like ecology and I had a very good ecology mentor and I realized that, you know, you can just be outside and, you know, you can learn all these magnificent things and have like an actual impact, you know, within your eco region. I, I was sold. There was no turning back. Yes, exactly. Now, you just mentioned another word that we kind of referred to at the beginning and it's extremely important, but a lot of people don't realize what we're talking about. And that's eco regions. Right. So. Tell us briefly what ecoregions are, and then you said that you worked within the interior low plateau ecoregion. So, yes, I know ecoregions don't obey state lines, but what states are we talking about? Because that's what people are going to understand. So, how's the best way to put it? I guess oftentimes when we look at a map, I think the average person, they look at states, they look at different things. But like you said, 
these eco region and these physiographic geologic regions, they don't obey state lines. So when we're talking about, you know, an ecosystem or, or similar levels of, you know, endemism and speciation, we're oftentimes talking about eco regions. So I work in the interior low plateau, which includes Northern Alabama, Tennessee, kind of central and West Tennessee, same thing in Kentucky, up into the tip of Ohio, Southern Illinois, and Southern Indiana. And that's kind of a very loose range, in all honesty. And within that, it's called the interior low plateaus. It's very diverse in grasslands. We have everything from, you know, the Pennyroyal Plain, which kind of creates those tips in Ohio and Illinois and down through central Kentucky and northern Tennessee. But then we also have like the Nashville Basin, which would have been tons of savannas and, and glades down into Alabama and the Highland Rims. And it's just this large area of really cool grasslands. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And yeah, I mean, people don't realize that the Southeast had so much grasslands. I mean, your reaction, sure, Tennessee grasslands. Yeah, right. You're crazy. <laughs> That's normal. I mean, I grew yeah. up in Kentucky. And we never really talked about it. I mean, when I was in college, we were just starting to talk about grasslands a little bit, but nothing like what we are now in the conservation ecology community. But yeah, it's, it's really amazing how diverse they are here. Absolutely. And it, it's very funny, you know, Dwayne Estes always talks about the myth of the squirrel. And I was taught that growing up in Florida, we have grasslands, you know, um, most of them are wet prairies. For the most part, we have some savannas and some coastal plain stuff. But I was very much taught growing up that outside of Florida in the south, it was just this vast, expansive, deep, old growth forest, where, you know, we have the myth of the squirrel, where it was thought a squirrel could go from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi without ever touching the ground. And that's obviously not true. And we know that now, but the same story that, you know, Dwayne Estes was taught in Tennessee and Giles County growing up, I was taught in, in Southern Florida. So when I have in my ecologic, you know, degree and, and knowledge from the Midwest and then knowing stuff that I saw back home in Florida and being taught, I was like, oh, that seems crazy. But you get here and you look at these things and, you know, if you have even the slightest eye for wildlife or, or botany, um, you're like, you know, what is this silphium doing here? Or, or what is this Tennessee coneflower doing here? Why is a coneflower endemic to the Nashville Basin? And then you start realizing, you know, I, I love reading about history. I read a lot about, you know, long hunters and, and pioneers. That's kind of like my area in history that I, I, I guess I fantasize. And they talk about coming across the, the Cumberland Gap. And they talk about even in the Appalachian Mountains, that all your, your warm, sunny sides of the mountain, they were all savannas, you know, and they maybe didn't say the word savannah. They were like, oh, you know, very sparsely treed, wide open, great for hunting bears. Uh, <laughs> that's clearly not, they're not describing a forest. So it's very cool to me to now be able to kind of piece together those history pieces with my ecologic and, and botany training and be like, oh yeah, all over the place, we're looking at grasslands. It may not be here right now, but they were here and they should be. Exactly. And steering us back to birds, because I can tell we're both about to go <laughs> way off the deep end back into the grassland <laughs> conversation. But they do go together because the grassland birds need the grasslands. But for some of our listeners who may not really be familiar with what we're talking about when we say grassland birds, because... They may know the bird species that we're talking about when we say them, but they're not putting them together with grasslands because, well, like we both just said, grasslands in the east? Yeah. yeah. Um, so <laughs> what are some of the grassland birds? Let's give them some examples. So I kind of consider these to be like the charismatic megafauna to me of like grassland birds, and these might not all be southeast. So, you know, the most notable that everyone knows in the southeast is going to be the bobwhite quail you know, ground nesting, kind of everybody's bird. Another good example that everyone kind of sees if you ever looked at a bird or interested is meadowlarks. 
Harriers to me are some of the coolest, you know, grassland birds. They have the name Marsh Hawk, but they, they are super awesome. Prairie chickens. Most people don't realize that we had prairie chickens, you know, in Kentucky and, and Tennessee at some time. Burrowing owls are also, you know, some of those charismatic grassland birds. And I always like to point out that like grassland is kind of a misnomer. Like, yes, the grass in these systems are important. And we're not talking about like a fescue grass field. The things that create the habitat for these birds are oftentimes the flowers, the forbs, and the diversity there. Those are kind of my, when I think of like grassland birds, they're like the mammoths and the bisons of, of grassland birds to me. Yes. And I mean, others that I usually think of are the sparrows, of course, the indigo buntings. Yep. You've already said the meadowlarks and the quail, mm -hmm. but I mean, with the, the diversity of types of grasslands, like what we were talking about, there's some that we don't even think about as grassland birds that really are. Um, yep. Bluebirds. Yep. Everybody loves bluebirds. Bluebirds need that open land. Yeah. But they're cavity nesters. Mm -hmm. That's why they go to the bluebird boxes. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so they would have been a savanna species oh, um, with those sure. really scattered trees. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, I even think about, I talk to a lot of people about, you know, meadowlarks, because everyone's like, oh, I used to see meadowlarks all the time, and they'd sit here, and it's like, well, you know, that's a grassland bird as well, and most people think of them as just, you know, this common generalist species, and it's, no, 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 they've seen really steep declines because, you know, we're losing these grasslands. They're absolutely grassland birds, and there's always you know, really unique species out there that kind of like are, people don't realize that these species belong to this system and their fate is tied to those systems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, meadowlarks and quail are two that just amaze me how much they've declined in recent oh, years. Yeah. I mean, I remember growing up, I used to go in the cow pasture next door. It wasn't ours, but we had permission to go play <laughs> in it and just constantly busting coveys of quail, just running yeah. around in there. And now my mother still lives in the same place, but we rarely hear the quail there. Mm -hmm. And lots of places that I went to as a child, I'm now going back to as an adult. I'm not hearing the quail around there that I used to. Yeah, it's, it's sad. I hear that same story all the time, all over the Southeast. You know, I work with a lot of private landowners and they're like, I haven't heard of quail here in 20 years or, you know, what happened to quail? And I think a lot of people kind of equate that everyone wants like this very smooth and like easy answer, right? And the easy answer is, oh, the coyotes got them, the ants got them, the birds got them. And that I'm sure plays a factor, predation plays a small factor in that. But really what's happened is, we've lost over 90% of our grasslands in the Southeast. Quail are grassland birds. If they don't have the habitat and they need a lot of habitat, they, they just can't, they can't deal with those, the predation. They can't deal with the environmental factors. They can't deal with harsh winters. So it, it's directly a decline in their habitat that's caused, you know, their precipitous decline where they've declined roughly 50% in the last 10 years you know, and they're still projected to decline by another 50% or so in the next 10 years, unless, you know, there's some huge shift, which we're trying to do, you know, we're, we're working on it, but it's, it's tough because it's a habitat issue. And, you know, everyone, it's easy to blame all these things that you have no impact on. It's a lot harder to say, Hey, I can make a difference even on my small lot by just creating some grass and bird habitat. Yes, exactly. And I mean, meadowlarks are another one that are greatly declining that I'm just, I grew up thinking they were so common and they were much more common. Yep. But yeah, I mean, you used to be able to see them just about on every fence post or every other fence post driving through the country. Yeah. And now you don't see that nearly as much. So yeah, it's really amazing because grassland birds are really one of our fastest declining groups of birds yep. when you look at the research and that's not something that a lot of people realize I think yeah Cornell lab came out with the study I think last year it's still pretty recent 
that overall birds have seen a decline about roughly 3 billion across population levels since the 70s. Of that 3 billion, 700 million of those are grassland birds. So a very large percent of overall decline are those grassland birds. And they're kind of the, the group of birds that are at most risk because we primarily, you and I think about grasslands in the Southeast, but it's not only an issue in the Southeast. The same issues that we're facing in the Southeast with losing our grasslands at, at very rapid rates is the same issues you hear in the Midwest about prairies and savannas or the same issues you hear in the Intermountain West. Grasslands in general are, are just declining and that's for a multitude of reasons. Grasslands are some of the easiest developed sites. You know, if you're going into a new area to put a home, you have this flat grassland where you don't really have to do anything except build your foundation, or you have this forest that you're going to have to clear cut or something. They choose the grassland. Or, you know, Nashville is a really good example. Nashville was settled so early on and, and developed so well is because it was a giant buffalo stamp and full of glades where you have this really good geology to build on. Out west, we have a lot of issues with energy production. That's where the oil is. And then we've seen this just growth and growth, precipitous growth of agriculture, where in the 80s, before quail started really declining, we still had agriculture, but we had this kind of messy agriculture with small family farms, where, you know, you had a messy hedgerows and you had the corners in the farm where the tractor couldn't reach and you were rotating crops constantly. We don't really see that anymore. Generally, you know, you're in big farm country, there's corn rows or soybean rows or, or cotton rows right up to the road and then right up to the creek. And then those fence rows have all been taken out and plowed out so that we can make more. And I'm all about cropping and farming. And even when we talk about ranching, it's very interesting to me that when you go west of the Mississippi, most ranches are grazing native warm season grasses. You go out to the Intermountain West and those cows are eating sagebrush, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're getting put out into the desert or the high deserts and six months later they're rounding them back up. Here in the Southeast, I mean, it's extremely rare to not find a fescue pasture. And whereas, you know, ranching can have negative effects on birds, if they're ranching those native grasses and doing it right, it can have a positive effect on bird populations. But fescue is absolutely awful um, for just about anything. It provides zero structure. It provides zero, you know, nutrition. It's just a biologic desert. Um, so like the mix of all those issues across, you know, the entire country is leading to the evaporation of our grasslands and by proxy, our grassland birds. And the grasslands birds really aren't getting the same attention now that the neotropical migrants got back in the 80s and early 90s. I mean, back then it was neotropical migrants are declining. We need these big forested areas, plant lots of trees, and everybody knew to do that. And that was something that everybody's working towards. And now we've got the grassland issue that we're recognizing and it's not being heard as much, which is one of the reasons why I thought it was important for us to get on and talk a little bit about grassland birds. Absolutely. It, it's a tough conversation to have. And I think us as educators, any biologists or, or anyone who works in conservation, ultimately we're educators. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, in, in the 80s and when the big push for neotropical birds and planting trees and stuff like that, everyone was really gung-ho for the cause. Like, let, let's do this. And we see it with a lot of other things. But as science develops, we're forced to relearn and, and re-understand different things or refocus at times. And sometimes the general public gets tired of that, <laughs> I guess, which is understandable. So now I'm oftentimes I'm speaking to a landowner where maybe 30 years ago, they were like, oh, we put in X, you know, we planted all these trees. Isn't this great habitat? And I'm like, well, yes, but you planted all those trees in a prairie remnant, so we should probably remove those trees. And sometimes that's a very hard pill to swallow, and understandably. I think the key to that, though, and, and the key to these conversations that we have to have with the general public is nuance and understanding. 
not everywhere should be a forest and not everywhere should be a grassland. And understanding those kind of ecologic cues and those botanical cues to be able to look through an area is very important. And it, it's very important to understand from uh, as, a, as a biologist, you know, I can't walk through an old growth forest and say that there should be a grass. And that's just a no. lie. You know, it's, it's wrong. But I can walk through a second growth forest where I'm seeing post oaks and, sh and shortleaf pines and I'm seeing in every opening, you know, native warm season forbs and say, hey, you know, these cues are probably telling me that we need to come in here and selectively remove some of these trees. So like anything in science, it's constantly evolving. <laughs> and I think that that creates a little bit of friction at times. But when you start, at least in my experience, when I'm able to walk with people in the woods, and I think that's the greatest time for education is walk with people outside. If you point these cues out, they'll start noticing them. And people are generally very smart and they want to learn. And then they'll, they, in my experience, they come around, you know, and they say, okay, you know, what can I do to help? I think a, a big thing that I talk to people a lot of time about also is they're like, I live in Nashville. What can I do, you know, to, to help out pollinators or grassland birds? And like, like people don't realize they're like, I can't do anything or my, you know, half acre yard can't do anything. And I always talk to them. I'm like, if we just band together a bunch of yards and converted them to native, just native gardening, I mean, that would be bigger than, you know, our entire national park system. So the best thing that a lot of people can do, even myself at, at my own property, I live in town, is I have a native garden. All the plants in my garden are native. I leave some parts that the city allows me to leave to be a little bit more wild, but that's super beneficial to these birds and, and to pollinators too, is just utilizing those native plants in the landscape is huge because then we can help out those things like meadow larks and maybe we won't get some of the the tougher species like quail or, or prairie chickens but some of the smaller birds are definitely would be able to help out by having a, a half acre lot that's groomed with native plants as opposed to fescue and that's one of the things too i think is like you were talking about going out walking it looking at what's already there talking to people about it and then kind of remembering that there's room for everything. There, there, there is that space. Yep. Not everything needs the same thing. So let's have a little bit of diversity. Yes. It, it, just like we don't want to cut, clear cut the old growth forests. We don't want to get rid of all of the prairies either or, and the grasslands and the diverse types of grasslands we have mm -hmm. here in the Southeast. And that, yeah, I'm just like you. Every little bit helps. And actually with grassland species, in many ways we can do, I think as individuals, I feel like we can do more mm -hmm. for them than we can for some of the deeper forest dwelling species Absolutely. because they need hundreds, thousands of acres sometimes yep. to really be able to get far enough in from the edges to have a good population of them. I don't have thousands of acres <laughs> uh, of woods. I don't have thousands of acres of anything. Yeah. But with those smaller amounts, yeah, we can do a lot for the grassland birds or the shrubland birds mm -hmm. or even those intermediate birds. I mean, back in 2021, I had an episode where I was talking to Dr. Katie Greenberg from the U.S. Forest Service and the Southern Research Station, and they were doing some long-term monitoring on woods in the Appalachian Mountains where they had kind of gone and opened things up a little bit. They were still woods. They hadn't mm -hmm. transitioned to what we would call more of a savanna. They were more what we'd call open woods, but they had that more open woods where you started to get that underbrush coming in more. And they were seeing a lot more biodiversity in those in the woods that they hadn't opened up. They lost a few species of the birds, like oven birds and such, but a lot of the more scrubland species were coming into it. So they had this mix yeah. going on there. And even that's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, as humans, you know, we like this clean cut idea of like, what's, what should be there. And, and in all reality, it's a lot more nuanced and complex than probably even we understand it as, as ecologists and having that kind of 
that marrying up of different habitat types or, or, you know, that it's just very important to have that diversity. We're looking for broad brush strokes and uniqueness. Um, I think that's very key to our habitat types all throughout the country. And it, it's very key. And like you said, a lot of these forested species, they need very mature trees. They need to get very deep from the edges. Maybe most people don't have that. I know I don't have a thousand acres, <laughs> I wish. But I, I think that even on these smaller farms and these smaller homesteads, you can do stuff to help some of those intermediate species or even some of those shrubland species and some of those grassland species. I think that, you know, when I was growing up in school, I feel like I'm younger than most people in this career field. I don't know why, but I was very much hammered into my head. We we're always talking about deforestation and deforestation in the Amazon and deforestation even in the Pacific Northwest. And, and it kind of got this conservation ethic that like a tree is good and a tree in the right place is perfect. A tree in the wrong place, I mean, it's, it's catastrophe for a lot of species in all honesty, you know, and a lot of these, these you hear around Earth Day coming up, you know, everyone's like, oh, let's go plant a tree. And I'm always like very, not critical, but I'm like, oh, where are you planting that tree? What, <laughs> what type of tree are you planting, you know? Are you planting a loblolly pine or a mimosa or, or a calorie pear? Or are you planting a white oak? And I think those things are, are important too. Understanding the, the slight nuances and understanding that we've got to have, we can't just have forests anymore. We need to incorporate these grasslands and these shrublands and these intermediate habitat types into not only our personal properties, but also into our properties within, you know, every agency, whether you're state, federal, or whatever it may be, we have to account for those habitat types. And I agree. And, and yeah, I grew up with the same, same thing that you did. Deforestation's bad, trees good, all <laughs> woods, that, yeah. that's perfect. Yeah, it was very simplistic. And biology, ecology, it's not simplistic. I mean, and really, when you think about it, why do we think it would be? life's not easy and simplistic and we all live life and know that's true yeah absolutely it's that that's the perfect word for it is people think that it people like a simple answer and i if the answer is simple then it's probably wrong you know <laughs> and i think i think about that oftentimes is you know that that deforestation stuff because I, I feel for that. And, you know, when we talk about like the Amazon and these other places, the deforestation is awful, but we're facing a similar issue with grasslands here in this country that no, not nobody, because we talk about it all the time. We're talking about it right now, but <laughs> the majority of people, they don't realize it, um, that on a level of Amazon deforestation, it's the same level of decline we're seeing in grasslands, if not more, which is leading to, you know, what we're talking about, where we've lost since the 70s, 700 million grassland birds. Like that's, I don't even know if I could count to 700 million in my lifetime. <laughs> that's, it's, it's tough. Yes. I mean, that's such a huge number. That's hard to even imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to ask a really difficult question because I know there's no simple answer with it. And that's almost what this question kind of starts to ask, but um, what are some of the things that grassland birds need, especially things that we can provide as homeowners, landowners, whether you have a small lot in town, and then also for those of us that have a little bit more acreage, maybe not thousands of acres, but maybe tens of acres or even a hundred, even hundreds of acres. So the number one thing that grassland birds need, that's kind of the hard thing is they need a lot of habitat. That's kind of the tough thing there. And we can achieve that by creating little coalitions and marrying up. At, ideally, it would be contiguous. But if Glenn Bob has a farm and then, you know, down the road, there's another farm and each one of these farms has a few acres of grass on habitat, those can kind of patchwork together wow. enough to be sustainable habitat. So ultimately, they obviously, they need grasslands, and that's, you know, a 30,000 foot view. Within those grasslands, they need what we'd call suitable vegetation. Each bird kind of has slightly different nuanced needs, but overall, what we're talking about is we need that diversity of wildflowers. We need that diversity 
of native grasses and it's really important for some species that there's not a thatch layer, the thatch layer doesn't matter to other species, but that diversity of different flowering forbs or wildflowers, as I like to call them, is extremely important to these species. They, they use it for seed sources, for pollen sources, they use it for bugging, they use it for nest building. Um, we need that diversity out there. And then they need safe nesting area in the summer. This is where I get on my rant where I'm like, park your bush hog, burn it. I don't know what you have to do. But in the summer, if you've got fields on your farm that are, are fallow or they're grasslandy, stop mowing them. <laughs> let them mature, let them go through it. Because a lot of these birds, if they nest in the ground or on the ground or in these little clumps near the ground. Not all of them, like you said, bluebirds are cavity nesters that use grasslands. But a lot of these species, they're nesting on the ground you know, they're ground nesting birds. When we mow that, I mean, we're literally just mowing our population down. So really having that summer nesting habitat is really key. And the other thing that people don't think a lot about is having that winter habitat as well. You know, when we're talking about like quail and some of these birds that aren't migratory, you know, they're living out in these fields and these pastures and, you know, these grasslands year round. So when we're talking about the dog days of winter where, you know, maybe it's 10 degrees outside and we've got 15 mile per hour winds and we've got snow and sleet and rain and it's doing all this in a week, those birds are out there surviving. So if we've gone down, you know, in the winter and we've mowed down all their habitat or whatever we've done, they're not going to make it. They need those vital, vital seed sources and, and those bugging sources and most importantly, that cover source all throughout the winter. So I say all that to say, if you've got a farm and you've got one, if you have a small acreage and you live in town or in a city, plant with natives. Do anything you can to bolster your insect population, your native insect population, because by proxy, that's going to help your native bird population. If you've got tens of acres or hundreds of acres, the simplest thing that you can do to benefit these birds is stop mowing in the summer and make sure we're leaving something for them in the winter. Fire is a huge part of these birds' life cycles and these grasslands' life cycles. That doesn't mean never use any disturbance because then it's just going to grow up in trees. But if you've got 10 acres, maybe only mow five acres this year. And then next year, mow a different five. And the same thing for burning. And if you've got 100 acres, break that into 20-acre plots or, or 10-acre plots. Understanding that we've got to leave some refugium out there for these birds because in reality, your place might be the only place that they have to go. So if you mow it all down or you burn it all down all in one swath, they might be out of luck. You know, they might not have another place to go. Those are kind of 30,000 foot view. I mean, we can talk about <laughs> the nitty gritties all day, but if I had to summarize the things that they need and what we can do most to help them across a broad scale, it'd definitely be those. I would definitely agree. And we'll, we start talking about the nitty gritty that really starts to go into into the different species because like you said different species are going to require slightly different things too yeah one of the hardest things for for me in my job sometimes is i run a program that's is geared towards henslow sparrows meadowlarks and bobwhite quail the bobwhite quail and uh meadowlarks a lot of their needs are the same <laughs> but <laughs> A henslow sparrow, for example, needs a thatch layer for, you know, nest building. Thatch layers are bad for both meadowlarks and bobwhite quail. Yes. So, you know, when we talk about stuff like that, it's important to know what birds you actually have around in the area. And, you know, that age structure, we were always taught that grasslands are quote unquote early successional habitat. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that to a degree, and I disagree with that to a degree. Yes, some grasslands are really successional, but we also have old growth grasslands um, that are very mature. But having different age groups of grasslands within, you know, let's say you're managing 20 acres or, or 100 acres, sectioning that out so you have one area that's very new and freshly burned, and then it can mature and have a rotation that's where we're gonna get that diversity that you were talking about earlier of habitat types where we're meeting multiple needs and multiple suitable habitats across that area. Yes, it gets complicated when you're trying to 
manage for the ecosystem and everything in it. And, and that's why I think a lot of times we do default back to, I want to manage for this species because it makes it easier, yes. but it may not be getting everything, which is what a lot of us want. Yeah. And yes, when we're talking about managing for quail or Henslow sparrows or any of these grassland birds, I mean, we're also managing for pollinators and when you're managing for pollinators, you're managing for grassland birds a lot of times. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so much more to it than just the one or two things that we're usually saying, yeah, this is what I want to attract to my property. We're getting more than, the, than just that. Yeah, absolutely. There's always, you know, great umbrella species. A good example of that is the monarch. I think the monarch is a great umbrella species. If we're managing for monarchs and we're putting milkweed and pollinator and grassland habitat out there, other things are going to use that as well. I think of quail a lot as a good umbrella species too. A lot of time when I'm dealing with landowners or people, you know, the, the elephant in the room is that there's a lot of consumptive users out there. So when we're talking to state agencies or stuff, they're like, okay, how is this going to affect our deer population or our turkey population? The great thing about managing for quail is it bolsters both those populations really well because in a grassland that a quail needs, there's tons of forage for deer, there's tons of nesting cover for turkeys. It, it's really beneficial. And I say that to say that you can manage for quail and have really, really good deer populations. It is very hard to manage for deer and have good quail populations. So managing for the right umbrella species, I mean, it just helps you out on so many other levels. Yes, that's a really good way to put it. So yeah, you spend a lot of time out in these grasslands and stuff. What are some of the cool, fun things that you've seen, especially the cool, fun birds and bird activity that you've observed? I guess, you know, I'm spoiled. I get to see a lot of birds. So <laughs> it's hard for me to imagine, you know, one specific thing. I saw, got to see a harrier eat a bunch of mice this year, which was kind of cool. <laughs> I tend to, I like predators a lot. Me too. <laughs> Anytime I flush quail, I mean, it's, it's exciting. And, you know, we're hearing once we get into spring and you start hearing whistles, like I'll be going out in the morning and driving some areas or even doing, you know, covey whistle counts. And like, I can remember last year I was on a farm and I just heard like the slightest whistle and I like stopped and I was like, I, I didn't just hear, you know, a bob whistle, did I? And then I listened again and I was like, oh my God, that was a bob whistle. And then I'm like fumbling to get my phone out to try and record it. And of course I started recording and it took like another 10 minutes to record, but I was able to send to that landowner, you know, hey, look what I just heard. And they were like, they called me crying. They're like, I haven't heard a bob on our property in 20 years, you know, and we just started managing two years ago. I think some of the coolest interactions I have are with people. I will say today I was out hiking, you know, in a glade and we caught a fence lizard, which I love herbs. <laughs> I'll, I'll never not get excited about, you know, a reptile or an amphibian. And, and that was just really cool. And just getting to see any of the things, you know, out. Some of my favorite things about these systems are actually not the animals, the, the plants in general. Last year I was at Bridgestone WMA and I was, writing we're doing a quail tour you know so we're we're with researchers who have you know gps monitors on quail and i just saw this orange thing out of the corner of my eye and we're driving this two-track road and i like yelled at the person driving i was like you need to stop like stop the truck and like they're like oh what did you see and i was like i don't know i gotta go check this out and i what what i saw was the first initial bloom of thousands of orange fringed orchids Oh, just all across this area. And, you know, I get called a plant nerd all the time. That's fine. Um, but I was like, that made my year to just, you know, one, be there to catch that bloom and two, call all these, you know, researchers and say, look how cool this is. It's like, yes, quail are cool. We often talk about plant blindness in our community. And I talk to a lot of undergrads and do mentoring. And I say, hey, you know, the animals, they're super cool. They're kind of like the entry level. Cool. Everyone loves animals. What you have to really love and understand is, is the plants, because without the plants, the animals have nowhere to go. You don't truly understand a bob white or a deer or a, a herb or any of these animals until you understand the plants that make up their communities. 
So I, I get to interact a lot with plants. I do a lot of plant videos and sometimes those are the coolest parts of my job. I always love seeing ospreys or rafters or all these cool kind of megafauna do their things. But at the end of the day, you know, I get really excited about seeing new species or learning new species of plants or understanding to deeper level the, the geologic and the ecologic needs of botanic species. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm... I started off being really interested in the mammalian predators, then more into the raptors and then into the little songbirds and then into the pollinators. And now I'm into the plants and herps have always kind of, or the reptiles and amphibians have always kind of interwoven in there more because of Anthony than my husband, than because of my own initial interest. But then now I'm like, oh, those are cool too. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's amazing how it all kind of intertwines and lines together. And then you're at the plants and yeah. that's just really the basis of everything and mm -hmm. being able to then take and mush it all together again and then see how it interacts and plays together is always so interesting. I always say to, to young ecology students, I'm like, if you're not a plant person yet, you'll get there. Trust mm -hmm. me. When I first started, I can remember doing my first vegetation surveys and I was looking at my advisor and I was like, why did I write this into this research grant? I am not enjoying this right now. I was out there with like a Robel pole and, you know, a meter squared and we're identifying every species in a meter square, which most people think that's not a lot, but there can be a lot of species in a meter square. Yes. And, you know, I look at like the progression of my career and it's like, now I'm like, I am, you know, this weird hybrid biologist botanist that like, <laughs> likes to do both things. I will say I had a really awesome experience this past week where I had some friends that are not ecologists or botanists. One's kind of a horticultural person come down to Tennessee. And unfortunately, we're kind of in this weird winter phase-ish now where some things think it's spring, but it's not really spring yet. But we got to go do some creek walking and catch some salamanders and these people had never seen salamanders before. So they're catching these salamanders and these crayfish. And it, it was just the most wonderful thing in the world. I think anytime you can take people out into nature, whether it's a grassland or a creek or whatever it may be, I mean, it's, it's very special and very fortunate to get to do that all the time. Yes, that's one of the things I always love to do too, is just get people out and just because I want to share all the cool things I'm finding. It's, it's no fun to keep them to myself. I and then always it's fun to educate people and teach people but I'll admit there's a selfish bit of me that just I want to geek out I want somebody to geek out with and teach yeah. and show and it's just fun and sometimes they really shock you with some I've been asked some hard questions from like people that don't really because they don't think we have like these echo not echo chambers but we're always talking to biologists and ecologists and botanists and we all we all have like similar lines of thinking at and then you take someone out who's not that and they ask you this question and you're just like shell shocked. Like, I've never thought of it like that. I'm going to do some reading tonight or, or, you know, sit there and really sit on the banks of a Creek or in a grassland and like try and think of how that interaction works. It, it's one of the, the greatest things I can ever do in all honesty. It's super fun. Oh yeah. And I'll agree. Some of the hardest questions I've ever been asked come from people who are just starting to learn and get interested mm -hmm. in nature and the outdoors. And it's because they don't know they're not supposed to ask those questions. And they're like, amazing questions. Yeah. But it comes yeah. from that different set of eyes and not, not trying to make everything fit in like we know right. it should do right. after all of our training and knowledge. Yeah, it never ceases to amaze me you know, just the questions that you get and, and the ability to like, people look at those things differently. And, and I always talk to anybody, whenever I'm giving, you know, these, these lectures or, or whatever maybe is, let's walk through a grassland together. Let's walk through a savanna together. Let's figure these things out. Because the eye that people have, you know, you develop an eye for certain things. You can pick out that little pink through a forest floor or that little orange for a flower, even, you know, as biologists, we become very good at picking up movement, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're, I always like, I'll be driving with my wife and like, I'll see a deer or something out of the corner of my eye in a field that's like way far off. And I'm like, oh, look at that over there. And she's like, 
how do you even know like what what are you talking about <laughs> my favorite time is we're driving across the the bridge in paducah going from kentucky to illinois and there's mm -hmm. this huge osprey nest on top of the bridge and we we're driving and i was like oh look at that osprey nest and she's like that just sticks you don't know <laughs> how do you see that and i was like it's very like once you pick up on those things and like you're able to show people those things it opens their mind to seeing like things that they never even realized before and that's when you start getting those questions and I think that that's been part of what's made me such a great biologist is those questions one you never want to give especially a kid the wrong answer mm -mm. so like you're like I gotta be on my p's and q's here and make sure I know what I'm talking about but teaching people I mean it it's taught me more than probably I've ever taught anybody, I guess, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. I mean, I learned long ago because I've always loved that combination of the research and the field work and the informal education. And I learned a very long time ago that the best way to learn something is to teach it. Because like you said, you don't want to give wrong information. And if you're teaching it to somebody, they're asking you questions. And we both already said some of the best questions that we've ever gotten have been from people who were still learning. Yes, absolutely. That's so true. So before we wrap up, can you tell us a little bit about Quail Forever and the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative or SGI and just how they can help people? Because I think those are two different organizations that really have the potential to help a lot of people that a lot of people don't realize that there are resources there for them. Absolutely. So the number one thing that I would say, especially for SGI, is you can learn so much from us just by following us on socials and in the internet. I know that we're always posting just informative information. We're hosting events, come out, get involved, and learn alongside of us because you know I host different events throughout the year a lot of them are education events and that's a very good tool you know if you've got me at an event you have the chance to ask me anything you want you know I might not have the greatest answer in all honesty but I'm gonna try really getting involved volunteering with SGI or just learning from us I mean it's phenomenal so follow us on socials follow all our newsletters stuff like that the biggest thing that Quail Forever can do, and, and SGI ties into this as well, is we've got biologists all across the Southeast. And all our biologists are there for is to help private landowners. And you don't even have to own your land, just to help people. So there's this vast network of biologists. And this isn't only in the Southeast, but it goes all the way through the Midwest and the West, that if you go online to quailforever.com or pheasantsforever.com and find a biologist, it will pull up your nearest biologist from Quail Forever or SGI, and you'll be able to ask them any questions you have about habitat work on your property. They'll come out, they'll do site visits. I do a couple hundred site visits a year. And whether you've got a quarter or an one acre, or you've got 200 acres, we're gonna try and help you achieve your wildlife management goals across that acreage. That's the main genesis of, of what I do with Quail Forever is we're going out and people are contacting us and saying, hey, I want to do habitat work for quail or for pollinators or for whatever it may be. And we're going out there and referring them not only to the like very technical details of how they can do that, but oftentimes there's a ton of cost share out there and through federal programs. So we're not only able to give you the technical advice, but we're able to say, hey, I think you'd qualify for, for this cost share. You know, you should apply for X with USDA and then we can do this and you'll get a little bit of money back for it. And that's always helpful too. Yes. Habitat work isn't always cheap. So if we can, you know, help out with a little bit of that cost, it goes a long way. Yes, exactly. So is there anything else you want to share with us? No, just make sure you, you follow along on SGI so that you can see my wildflower of the week videos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Those are always really good. But yeah, this has been really interesting. Thank you so much for chatting with us tonight. And I will definitely be putting links in the show notes to both Quail Forever and the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative in case people want to go find out more about those organizations and learn more about them. And if people have questions, especially if they're in that interior low plateau ecoregion, 
can they contact you directly? Absolutely. That'd be great. Okay. I will put your contact information in the show notes as well. But yeah, thanks again for chatting with us. This has been so much fun. Thank you. It's been a blast. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. (laughs) I really appreciate Jeremy taking the time to talk with us today. The plight of grasslands and grassland birds is an important one that I believe needs to be discussed more often. It's not always an easy discussion, and especially in the East, it requires being open to new thoughts and new knowledge that may contradict some of what we grew up believing or thought we knew. But just because the conversation can be difficult doesn't mean that we should ignore it. One of the things that really brought this issue home to me was the Bob White. I never fully realized or appreciated it at the time, but the Bob White was an integral part of my childhood. I listened to their calls as I played in my room or in our yard. As I explored the neighboring field and pasture, I often felt the thrill that comes when a covey of quail flushes from practically right under your feet. Anyone who has experienced that knows exactly what I'm talking about. I don't think there's anything else like it. And then when my family was out somewhere and my brother and I wandered out of sight of our parents, my father would do the Bob White whistle to call us back to them. The Bob White's call was just one of those sounds of home for me. So if you had told me back then that the Bob White could become functionally extinct in the wild during my lifetime, I never would have believed you. But a few years ago, I found out that that's becoming a very real possibility. And there are many birds whose populations are already in much worse shape than the Bob Whites. We need to recognize and appreciate the importance of our grasslands and then act to manage our lands appropriately if we have any hope of saving these birds. And like Jeremy said, we're not saying that everything should be grasslands. There are places that absolutely should be forests, just like there are places that absolutely should be grasslands. The trick is figuring out where each should be and then doing what needs to be done in each of those locations. Before I wrap this up, I wanted to let you know that I also write a backyard ecology blog. If you are enjoying these podcast episodes, then you might want to check out my blog as well. The easiest way to find my blog is to visit my website at www.backyardecology.net. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.